Good morning, Shoreline Church. It's great to be here this morning. I wanted to welcome everyone. Thanks for coming on to our online worship service here at 10 a.m. Uh, as we know, we are uh, continuing our online services. Uh, the pandemic is still alive. It is waning, but we are hopeful and prayerful. I know it's on many of your guys' hearts to get things back to normal. Uh, I came across a psalm in 13 that I think has, you know, different meanings. Whenever I read the Bible at different times of my life, it always has a new, new meaning for me because the Bible is living and active. In Psalm 13, it says, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy, how long will my pandemic triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Our God is good. Our God is worthy of praise. And this morning, we shall do that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. God, you're worthy of our praise. You're worthy from the, the words of our mouths. God, as we sing to you, as we praise you, as we lift up your name, as we think about your goodness, your qualities, God, that you're a loving God, slow to anger, abounding in love. You are inherently good. Uh, you love us. You've redeemed us. You've helped us. You've served us. You've sacrificed for us, God. And we're so thankful for this morning to praise you because you deserve it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is well, so let go of 
It is well.
Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. We have a, a lesson this morning. It's one of the lessons that um, is pretty intense. So I just wanted to prepare you this morning. This is an intense story. In fact, it's gruesome. Um, and it's, it's one of the important stories of the Old Testament in the sense of what it's trying to accomplish. And that story is found in Judges chapter 17. You may have heard a few sermons about this uh, gruesome um, chapters of the Bible and where Israel is in tribal formation. They've taken into the promised land. They live there. They exist there. And there are these 12 tribes of God's people. And they're trying to live in, in the promised land. And there's a story that has, it captivates a lot of Bible readers because it's, it has, you know, murder, it has rape, it has abduction, uh, and all kinds of, you know, if you're a, 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 a real crime enthusiast, this is part of the Bible that you're going to go, wow, this is intense, this is awesome. But there is also an underlying message to that, and people get kind of caught up into the gruesome details, but there's actually another message that the writer is trying to draw you into. He's trying to captivate you to, into looking uh, into something else in this story. So when, when you read your Bible uh, and, you, and you look at your Bible, the writer's always trying to draw you into it. He's trying, he'll leave out information just to, just to make you wonder why, are they, why, why, where is this and why is that? Because he's trying to draw you in. And it's a literary device they use uh, in the Bible. Whenever you read the Bible, you have to know what you're reading. You know, it's an, it's an ancient Mediterranean document, you know, whether it's the Greek culture or whether it's the ancient Near East and the Mesopotamia culture. So there's a lot of things in there that relate to the culture. And it's a pre-scientific uh, document. This is not trying to prove science. It's not trying to confirm science. In fact, these guys knew, knew very little about science. And, and God knew what he was getting. And he presumes the culture of the writer. So God wades into this culture and draws his people to him and write, provides a document for, uh, for um, the people of his time and, and also for us. The Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. And so I know there's also this supernatural view of the Bible, which we're not going to get into today, but you should know that that's the worldview. So God knew what he was getting and he knew what he was using. He was using writers of that time to accomplish something important. So let's, let's understand the book of Judges, what, it, what it's about, what, it, what, it's, what its purpose is. It's written during the time of, of King David. They had just gotten done with King Saul, and he was a very terrible leadership of the king. He was unfaithful to God. He rebelled against the prophets. He rebelled against God. He did a lot of things that were not right. And so God removed him from leadership and raised up David. And so the writers in David's time are drawing back prior to having a king, and they're telling accounts and stories of why it's so important to have a king. And what I want you to pay attention to this morning is look at the association of the different characters of the story and what tribes they're from. You have the tribe of Judah that's mentioned in the story. You have the tribe of Benjamin that's mentioned in the story. And then you have the tribe of Ephraim that are mentioned in the story. And also the tribe of Gad that comes later in this story. And the reader is being drawn in to embrace the kingship. That having a king is good. David is a great king. And we should be thankful we have a king that is from the line of Judah. So God's man is from Judah. This is a man after God's own heart. And so we get to the story, and it's, it's a horrific story. Like I said, it has a lot of grim details, which I won't specifically get into. I'm just going gonna, gonna to walk us through the story. I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to have slides to explain the stories. But like I said, this story contains murder, contains rape, contains war, contains abduction. I mean, it's repugnant when you read it. It's repugnant. But there's something else in the text that the writer wants you to look at besides the blood and the gore. I mean, this, this could be on a, easily on a Netflix special. It's not a cheap thriller. There's a theological message that it's important for you and for me and the, and the readers of that time. 
it was important for them because the, the writer's trying to draw you into the story and he'll leave certain things out just to make you curious. And when you read the Bible, you should read the Bible with a curious mind. Like, why is that? And where's this? And why is this person missing? Why is that segment missing? Why is the reader not filling us in on all the detail? Because you're being drawn into a story. So the, the prior to this, there was a lot of idolatry. The tribes were, were, were living their lives independently of each other, but they were still considered the unified nation of Israel under 12 tribes, and God was to be their king. But as time went on and generations rose up, rose up they, they, they got away from the Torah. They got away from the instructions. They got away from what God was wanting them to be as a people to attract other nations to them because God wanted to bless all the nations through Abraham. And in this story, the tribes are not enforcing, they're not uh, applying the Torah. Uh, it's like the wild, wild west in the book of Judges. Um, there's some bad characters, there's anarchy, and there's some good characters in the storyline. But ultimately, God is in charge of what's happening, and God steps in to, to do something that's interesting, which I'm going to point out later. So this, this idea of Israel, it, it, it doesn't do well without a king. And the book of Judges is, is, is convincing the readers that Israel needs a king. God is our king, but we need a human king to show us, to lead us. And that sets the stage for the true king to come through the line of David in the New Testament. And that is our king, Jesus Christ. So I want you to notice these tribes. I want you to notice the tribes are from, again, Ephraim, Judah, and Benjamin. Because the writer's pointing them out for a reason. He's pointing out towns. And he's pointing out tribes, because if you're a reader at that time, you know exactly which tribe is which. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a little map here and a little scripture about what the Bible says about these kinds of things. That, it, that This is a theme throughout the scripture, throughout this whole book, is that in those days, Israel had no king. And he's trying to promote the kingship of David. And so there was a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim. And he took a concubine, which is like a secondary wife. So in that culture, they had they had maybe one or two or three wives, and there was the there was the main wife, and then there was there was lesser wives, and they were referred to as concubines. And so he, he his concubine had left him, she was unfaithful, and she went back home to the tribe of Judah. This Levite was from the country of Ephraim. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. So he, they're already the writer's already trying to affiliate this guy is in this tribe. His concubine is from Judah. So he's got to travel. So here's a little map just to give you an idea. There is there is um, uh, Bethlehem. I circled it in the very bottom. Uh, that's where uh, obviously Jesus was born eventually later. So that's where the lady is from. She goes back home to be with her dad. And he's from Ephraim. He's from the tribe above. And in between Ephraim and Judah are the tribe of Benjamin and Dan. So he travels from Ephraim all the way down to Bethlehem to convince her to come back. Uh, and that's, that's important because B Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, had King Saul. So that people already knew that. So king Saul, bad king. Benjamin, this Levite who had priestly duties. He was a, a one of the lesser priests, but he had duties in the temple. And so he comes back and he wants to get her back. And he, he travels down there with his men and he, to try to win her over. And so this is kind of the storyline of the of this chapter in the book of Judges. He wants to retrieve her. She's down in Judah and she's in Bethlehem. And when he's down there, the father of, the, of his wife, of the concubine, shows him incredible hospitality. He's warm. He's welcoming. They're in Judah. This is David's tribe. So David's tribe is hospitable. This is a good man from Judah. He's warm and he's kind. Hospitality was very important in the ancient Near East. And it's very important to us today. That is one of the centerpieces of how we get to be closer to people and how we get to have an impact on people is just being hospitable and being warm and being kind. So already in the story, Judah is hospitable. Judah is warm. Uh, when you go down there, you should expect to be treated well. 
And so when he's down there, he, he travels down uh, from Ephraim and he, and, he, and he convinces her to come back home. So he wants to go back to the tribe of Ephraim and he has to travel through the tribe of Benjamin. Now in the tribe of Benjamin, there is a city called Jebus. Jebus later on in history is going to become the city of Jerusalem. It's actually an oasis. It's actually one of the rare spots in the tribe of Benjamin where it's not, it's, it's good to be there. And so the, the, the Levite decides not to stay in Jebus because when they took the territory in the promised land, they failed to conquer that city. And so there was Gentiles who lived there. And the priest um, does not want to be there because those people are Gentiles. It's just another example of biblical racism in the Bible. And the Jews were always accused of that because they were always appalled at the other um, people living around them. Instead of, instead of being loving and kind, and obviously they serve a different God and a different uh, system of worship, they should have been kind to them. They should have been loving to their neighbors, but instead they were like aghast and appalled and didn't want to be around them. So instead of stopping there, he travels further up into the, the tribe of Benjamin, into a town of Gibeah. And um, even his, even his uh, servants were trying to convince the Levite, hey, maybe, you know, we shouldn't go, we should, we should stay here. Let's stop in this city. And the writer's telling you, because that town is good. They're going to be safe there. They should stop there. But the master replied, the Levite replied, no, we won't go into that city whose people are not Israelites. And so a fateful decision to not stop in the oasis of Jebu is going to prove brutal consequences here in the story. So let's continue. As they go on in verse 15 of chapter 19, the Levite journeys to, uh, to Gibeah, which is in the tribe of what? Benjamin. Well done. Good answer. And the old man is from what tribe? Ephraim. Good job again. And he offers refuge to the, the Levite and his concubine. They're in the city, city town there in the in the town center, and he goes, hey, it's dangerous, come with me, and then they come into his house, and then while they're at his house, while they're, while they're being, this man is uh, attempting to be hospitable, a group of wicked men, the Bible says these are worthless men in the Hebrew, they're sons of Belial, wicked, evil men, surround the house and demand, the old man surrender the Levite to them so they can molest him. Gruesome and repugnant. And the Benjamite, the men of Benjamite, the rapists of that town of Gibeah are clearly wicked. So tribe affiliation, Benjamite, wicked men. Gibeah, really wicked men. Saul was from the Benjamite tribe. He was the first king. No wonder he wasn't a good king, right? See that the writer's trying to draw you in going, Saul bad, David good. And pounding on that door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so that we may have sex with him. A parallel story to Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham's nephew Lot was near in Gomorrah. This is one of the same events that happened when God sends two angels. The, the men surround the house and they want to do the very same things. But to the angels, they don't know they're angels, but they're there to destroy that city. Wicked situation here in the book of Judges. The old man who is hospitable offers his virgin daughter. The man offers his daughter to wicked men. The man is a villain. That is not right. That is not good. He's ruthless. He's callous. And then all of a sudden, the Levite, who's, who's being shown hospitality, he forces his wife outside and outside to the men so they can be satisfied. And the very next morning, after all night, of raping her, she dies. And she dies on the doorstep of the old man's house where her husband is inside. And without any remorse, without any compassion, he puts her on his donkey and takes her home. 
The Levite from what tribe? Ephraim is a villain. He's associated with a renegade northern kingdom that forsook and rejected the line of David. And the old man is from Ephraim. He's another villain in the story. He allows and puts out his, he was willing to offer his daughter to these wicked, evil men. And the husband is callous. The Levite is callous. He's cold. He doesn't try to rescue her. No attempt to rescue his wife. No mourning. No concern. Just puts her back on the donkey and takes her up to Ephraim. He protects himself. And she pays the price for his cowardice. This is the, the, back, the background to the book of Judges. This is a background to drop tribes and people who have strayed away from the Torah. This is something so sad and so brutal. And so the, he takes her up to his uh, hometown. And what tribe? Ephraim, good job, you're, you're catching on. And then he does the unthinkable. He cuts her into 12 pieces. Hebrew says by the bone. And he sends her body parts to all the tribes of Israel. And he summons a meeting from all the tribal leaders. He summons all of them. Come on down. Let's meet because we need to retaliate against these wicked men in the tribe of Benjamin. And all the tribes, when they hear this story, they are outraged. Except one, Benjamin. They're not outraged. They won't hand over the men. They won't do anything to these men. The tribe of Benjamin is where Saul was from. Bad tribe. They refused to give these men over for punishment. And the result is tribal warfare. And all the tribes of Israel gather together. War breaks out. And they're angry. And whenever we lash out out of insecurity and, or out of anger, we can create massive human carnage. We can damage our relationships. We can damage our marriages. We can damage our friendships. Benjamin was in moral decline. But aren't they forgetting something? Aren't they forgetting the Torah? Aren't they forgetting what God says what to do? God has, God has instructions for these kinds of things in the Torah. But they ignore the Torah. Emotions trump the scriptures. Rage trumps the Torah. Can we do that? Are we capable of this? Anyone is capable of trumping the Bible because of our emotions. The Benjamite leaders, they refused to do what was right. And the Bible says when he reached home, he took out a knife and cut his concubine limb by limb, the 12 parts, and sent him to Israel. What a dark, dark moment this was. And then they, they go up, and the Israelites, the, the tribes go up to fight Benjamin. In the first battle... They lose thousands of men. And they, they, they inquire of God first. What should we do? Judah goes first. They go up there and they lose. And they crowd again. And they go back into battle. And they lose again. Which is weird. You, you, they're supposed to win. But they lose twice. And the third time God, they inquire of God and God says, okay, I'll hand them over to you. And they go and nearly completely annihilate the tribe of Benjamin, except for 600 men. And this is how you should read your Bible. Why did God, why did God allow the Israelites who didn't mistreat that concubine, who didn't commit that, that heinous crime, who didn't do anything, but were trying to, you know, correct a wrong? Why are they being punished in battle? Why was not God with them? Why didn't God give them a swift victory? So when you read your Bible, the, 
read with curiosity. Why is that? Why are there 40 Israelites dead and only 25,000 Benjamites dead? That was the numbers that we tallied in the story. Why is that? Israel didn't do this. They're supposed to be the Avengers. And maybe that was the problem. Maybe that was the problem. It wasn't theirs to avenge. It wasn't them. They were not supposed to take matters into their own hands. God had specific, detailed instructions on how to handle these kinds of things. So the tribe of Benjamin, 11 tribes versus one, they end up losing more men in the, in the initial battle than the Benjamites. And then they almost completely eliminate the tribe of Benjamin. And they realize when, when 600 run away and they're, and they're scattered, they're like, oh my gosh, what have we done? We, we've almost destroyed it, literally a tribe of Israel. Because there's supposed to be 12 tribes. And when the rage subsides and the reality sets in, anarchy took over. Chaos ensued. They don't have a king. God is not being sought after. The Torah is being ignored. And they go, what do we do? How do we, how do we re, reinvigorate this tribe? We got to you know, we killed everyone in the towns. We, we destroyed everything. We killed the women too. Everyone was just getting destroyed. What do we do? There's 600 men left and they have no wives because when, they're, when their rage subsided, the reality of what they've done sets in. And this is the dark thinking. Like, hey, wait a minute. How are we gonna, how are we gonna allow these men to have women so they can keep their tribe ancestry going? Because that was important in the ancient Near East, that you had children and they had children and you had a little tribal nation there. They go, okay, let's think about this. Who wasn't at the assembly? Ah, the people of Gabesh Gilead in the tribe of Gad. They didn't show up to our meeting. They didn't show up. And so, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have the guys in the Benjamite tribe who need wives. We're going to send them up there and they're going to abduct a woman for themselves and make them their wives. Another bad decision. Horrible dating advice. Horrible dating input to do that. But they are without a king. They strayed from the Torah. They strayed from the scriptures. And this is what people are like. Spiritual people can do horrible things if you stray from the scriptures. If you stray from what God has called us to be and called us to do. This is why that story, this story is so powerful. Any of us are capable of doing harmful things to others. So they decide to go do that and they abduct these women and force them to be the wives of the men who are left in the tribe of Benjamin. When you lash out out of insecurity, you will indulge your flesh. You will do what feels right. And you will leave a wake of destruction around you relationally. In the New Testament, it's a different kind of story. Jesus comes, the true king, the true Messiah from the tribe of Judah. This is what Judges is trying to tell the readers. Look, we need a king. And the tribe of Judah is where the Messiah will come from. He's going to come. The true king, not these Benjamites, not the Ephraim tribe, not those tribes, not Gad, none of those, but the tribe of Judah. And Paul gives us instructions. This is our Torah. This is the New Testament covenant. And when Paul says, he goes, hey, be careful. You're free. And you were called to be free. Amen. Amen. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't use your freedom to do what you want. There are things that you may not you know, violate in the scripture, 
and we want to, you know, we want to exist between the lines. Don't indulge your flesh. Don't use your freedom like that. Rather, he says, serve one another humbly in love. Who is your king? Better yet, who are you? Who are you? You know, when I was reading this story, what kept sticking out in my mind was Deuteronomy 32. And this is something that Paul says in Romans 2. It is mine to avenge. God says, hey, I'm the one that will, that will, that will do the disciplining. I'm the one that will repay. Not you and not me. And in the book of Judges, they took it on themselves to avenge a wrong. They forgot that God was the king. They forgot that God's in control. And many times you're going to interact in society, in our world, in our community, at work, in our church. And you're going to be offended. Someone may offend you. And you may want to seek revenge. It is not for you to do that. It is for you to get resolved. Not to seek revenge. Who are you? And that's what the book of Judges is is telling the nation of Israel, who are we without a king? We're reckless. In the New Testament, who are you without a king? What do you like when you don't have a governing authority like the king of kings, the Lord of lords in your life? Who are you? You know, Paul writes, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. When Paul, before becoming a Christian, he was taking revenge and he was taking matters into his own hands. He was hunting down the disciples, men, women, and children, and throwing them in jail. He was doing the very same things like they were doing in Judges. He took matters into his own hands and then he met the King of Kings. And he, and he writes this parallel passage. Look, he goes, guys, don't live for yourself. Don't live as if you have no king because you will do harm. You'll have no impact. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, the King, who loved me and gave himself to me. Because life without a king can lead to harming others. The good news is there was a, there's a righteous king that came through the line of David. Although all those kings had failed, Jesus did not fail. After all those kings was, were tested and they failed, Jesus did not fail the test. Although he was tempted in every kind of way similar to all of us. He did not fail the test. And his name is Jesus. And now is the time to make him Lord of your life. Now is the, now is the time. Today is the day to renew your relationship with the King of Kings. If, you're, if you've been coming to church, if you've been studying the Bible, this is the time that God is calling you to follow him, to make him Lord of your life, to make Jesus Lord of your life. And as we think about that in his death and burial and resurrection, think about who are you? Where are you? Where are you in relationship to the King of Kings? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we are just humbled and grateful to be called by you, to be drawn in by you, as Paul, Paul wrote earlier, just to be, you know, crucified with Christ and no longer live for ourselves, but you living in us, us being uh, the vessels that your temple, your spirit lives in, and we are that temple for those around us. Help us to have the warm and kindness and compassion that Jesus has with us. Help us to reflect the very things we love about you and we reflect those to those around us.
God, help us not to take, um, you know, help us not to be uh, indulging in our flesh, even though we're free, but help us to really humble ourselves and serve one another because it's what you want for humanity. We thank you for Jesus. We love you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. How deep the How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all We've come to a portion of our service where we uh, give our tithing. There's a great story in the Old Testament where uh, Abraham is um, uh, determined to rescue Lot, who, who was taken, he was abducted by their kings in the area. And so Abraham gathers his uh, his household and he goes and, and he and he has victory. He astonishingly beats all these kings. It's a, an incredible story of victory. And after it's, after it's done, after after all the uh, the collection has been made and, and returning, we're, we're getting a lot back. And even, um, you know, some of the victorious spoils that he got from war, there's this uh, m- mysterious figure that comes out of uh, Jerusalem or Jebu and it's Melchizedek. And he's, uh, he's the, it says the Bible describes him as a priest of the most high God. He was, a, he was someone that understood that there were gods but Abraham's God was the most high. He was unique. He was alone in his standing among all, all the other gods. And what Abraham does, he remembers God. And he gives Melchizedek a tithe out of respect and honor to the most high God. Abraham remembered to do that. He didn't have to do it. He wasn't instructed to do it. But he remembered to do that. And as we give our offering, I want you to remember what God has done for you. And in fact, if you forgot to give last month, I want you to remember what God has done and go ahead and have it and give last month and this month today. Remember what the God of Most High in heaven has done for you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. 
for giving us victory in our lives, victory over sin, the forgiveness of sin, the redemption of our, of our being to be with you. We're so thankful and grateful. And we honor you. We remember you. We don't want to ever forget you and what you've done. We give our contribution to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I wanted to share a little bit about this fundraiser. I uh, shared a little bit last week about it and um, it was a great video. And in case for some reason you missed it or that you um, forgot how to do things or you would like to see it again, I'm gonna show the video. Um, so this is a fundraiser for Shoreline that we're doing to raise money. And uh, the great thing about it is that we are not gonna have to spend money out of our own pocket. It's money we are already going to spend. And so I'm going to show the video to explain how it works. I did send an email last week. I'll send another one this week as well with all the different links to um, help you load up for that and um, sign up for it. Okay, so here, here we go. Thanks for being part of our service this morning. Uh, you can always catch these. These are all recorded uh, on our YouTube channel uh, at 805 Shoreline Church. And we also, I think, post them on the Shoreline website as well. For, always check the events page in our calendar and so forth. Uh, right now, we're going to be heading into our breakout room for some fellowship. Try to show your screen face. Uh, it's encouraging that people can see you and connect with you as we're doing church online this morning. We love you and thank you for being here. Let's go to our breakout rooms. <laughs> 